And my message today is going to talk about how we can pray. You know, we know as Christians what prayer is, but sometimes we wonder if we're doing it right. And maybe you wonder if God hears you when you talk. Do you ever find yourself there? Do you find yourself avoiding prayer because you don't know what to say or you're afraid you don't have the right words? You may say, I'm just not that eloquent or you're afraid of the silence because now it's just you and God and all of those things that you're worried about just start to come up and you don't know what to do with that or perhaps sin in your life keeps you from talking to God. And maybe if you're honest, you're just not quite sure that God is there. When I was young, living with my parents, uh, talking single digits, eight or nine years old, I can remember I had my bedroom in the basement of the house we lived in, so I'm kind of off by myself. And for a series of nights, I started having these nightmares. And I would wake up in the middle of the night having dreamt that somebody was trying to smother me and I would wake up feeling like I was being choked and it scared me. I was terrified, literally. And that really is the first memory that I have of praying to God of my own volition other than praying to accept Christ because these dreams scared me so much and I knew the only one who could take them away was God. And so every night before I went to bed, I would pray, God, will you please stop these dreams from happening? And it didn't take very long, and they were gone. And I've had some pretty crazy dreams since then, but nothing like that. Praying, prayer, literally is simply talking to God. The God who made you, who cares for you, actually invites you to talk with him. When my girls were young and they're now adults, my wife and I would hear them in the middle of the night and the same thing with my son. And when they would cry or cry out, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning and they would start making noise, we immediately would go and check on them. What, what's wrong? And if you're a parent, you understand that could be anything from I'm thirsty to you're discovering a disaster that has happened in their bed. It's not fun, but it's necessary. And you're there to love them and comfort them and care for them. My my youngest, my son, even now, sometimes it's late. A couple of times it's happened in the wee hours of the morning when everybody has been asleep and I hear a knock on my door and he comes in, "Dad, Dad, are you awake? Yeah. And he wants to check on me or he's saying goodnight or he's making sure that this noise that he heard isn't something that he should be afraid of. And now I have the privilege of having a grandson and when he sleeps over the house or he stays over for the afternoon and he takes a nap, y'all know how this works. He's, he's sleeping and then you hear, ah! and it's not once or twice before somebody is running to go get him because we love that boy. We love our kids. God loves his children and he is always listening. He remembers and he knows what is best. Maybe you wonder if God is really there, if he cares or if he can or will help you. Today, this message is for you. You know, our world has stopped believing in God for the most part. We can thank the enlightenment for that. You know, the the movie Encanto, which you've heard Pastor Eddie talk about a few times, and he kind of even does a little dance. We don't talk about Bruno. We don't talk about God. We stopped trusting in God, and we began trusting in humanity. And then a few world wars, and just watch the news, and you find out why that's just a really bad idea. So we think that God can't be trusted in our culture, and we we know that others can't be trusted. So what, what do we do? We begin to trust ourselves. Bookstores are full of self-help sections that are just huge, but we still aren't free. We've just traded one prison cell for another. When the truth is, God is there, God is present, God is trustworthy, and we can't trust ourselves. Our hearts are wicked and deceitful. So today I have four points for you. One, 
Worry, then pray. And some of you are going, the Bible says don't worry. We'll get there, don't worry. See, you're already worried. Two, helpless before hopeful. Three, look up and then look back. And then four, what if there is no answer? Often, instead of praying, we worry. We're professional worriers. We get really good at it. What if, what if I left the oven on or the stove and the house burns down while, while we're gone? What, what if I forgot to lock the front door and somebody gets inside? That's happened at my house more than once. Come home, wow, the front door was unlocked. The key was in it one time. And now some of you are worried. Like, oh, uh, maybe somebody check and see if my house is going to burn down. Now, here's the thing. I'm not suggesting you ignore the instruction of Jesus in Matthew 6, wherein he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Life, food, drink, clothing, tomorrow. 2,000 years later, these are the things we're still worrying about. So if Jesus says, don't worry about them, why, why am I telling you to worry, then pray? Because, because this, worry is like a rocking chair. I heard this one time and it has stuck in my brain. Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it gets you nowhere. So what, what should we do? We, well, we can worry and then pray. And here, here's why I say that. Because you see, Jesus came for sinners And that means we all qualify for his help, and we all worry. We spend too much time worrying about all kinds of things, and when we do that, we become anxious, and anxiety fills our hearts and our minds. Did you know that anxiety is actually about control? You want to control the outcome of whatever it is that you're concerned about. And when we desire to have that control, we're trying to be God. And that's why you struggle with anxiety. You're trying to be God. And what you need is a link to God. And that link is found in prayer. Do you know what an unused prayer link looks like? Anxiety. Anxiety wants to be God, but it lacks God's wisdom, his power, and his knowledge. And because anxiety is the self all on its own, it wants to control and there is no ability to relax. You solve one problem and you're like, great, on to the next one. And that's your life. Did you know that Jesus, the God man, was the first human to demonstrate how to live a dependent life on God? And here's how he did it. By continuous contact with his father. He tells us over and over again in the gospels. He lived in a state of dependence on God the father. He lived out what Psalm 131 says. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. If you're a parent and you have a teen driver, you're probably not calm, especially if you're riding with them. But even more so once they've gotten their license and they go off and they drive on their own. And you begin doing something you never thought about doing before. You begin to pray for your child who's driving and the rest of the world whom they could impact by one bad decision. And, and then... As those kids you have grow older, they get married and they have a child of their own, you become a grandparent and that cycle starts over. If you have grandchildren and you've seen your kids drive away after a visit, you start thinking, I remember how they drive and my grandchild is in that car and you begin to pray in earnest once again. And if you love them, you'll do that, but it should not come from a position of anxiety It should come from one of concern. And maybe you struggle in school, at work, living life, and there's worry that comes. When I travel, and I get to do that every once in a while, sometimes it's a trip to Kansas City, sometimes it's a trip across the country. Every once in a while, it's on a plane around the world. Every time I travel, before I go travel, before we begin that journey, we pray and ask God to care for us and watch over us and keep us safe 
Don't take it for granted. And this is what you should do. Whatever it is that you worry about, fine. Build a list. Write it all down. And then turn that into your prayer list. God, I'm worried about my money. God, I'm worried about what's going to happen with my kids. God, I'm worried about and pray. Worry, but don't leave it there. Pray, ask God to work and move and then let it be so that you're not trying to be in control. You have the link to God that you should have. We see this in the life of Nehemiah. The book begins with him praying and asking God to give him wisdom, to show him should he go to Jerusalem where the temple has been built and now the walls need to be built. And when you get to chapter four, he has arrived, he has rallied the troops, he's delegated the work there in the process of building the walls. And in the beginning of chapter four, these two gentlemen, maybe not gentlemen, but these two men by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah have come around and they're attacking the work and they're despising and making fun of the people. And they're saying things like, well, even if a, a, a fox were to jump on that wall, it would fall down. And if you don't know how big a fox is, like think of slightly bigger than a cat. And if you've built a good wall, a fox will not knock that wall down. What does Nehemiah do? He prays to God. He does not respond to those men. He prays and he says, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. And the work continued. And in two months, 52 days actually, the work was done. And in that place, God's work was done because they trusted him and he protected them. What, what are you struggling with? What worry presents itself to you all the time? You need to learn to apply what Paul told the church in Philippi. And for many of you, this verse will be very familiar. But I want to point out something that comes before Philippians 4, 6. And that is the end of Philippians 4, 5. It says, the Lord is near the Lord is near. And then Paul says these famous words, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. What's your worry? You know, there's an old hymn that I thought of when I was preparing this message called, what a friend we have in Jesus. The second verse says, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In the book on prayer that we have made available to you called A Praying Life, it's by Paul Miller, and he tells a story um, of his daughter. And his daughter has autism, and she gets up early about every day about 4.30 in the morning. And she's not supposed to be up. Her parents have said, you need to stay in bed. It's not time to be up. But she would get up anyway. And she would turn the hall light on. And since she knew she wasn't supposed to be up, she'd go back to bed and about five minutes would go by. And then she'd go back up, turn the hall light off, get back to bed. And this cycle would continue until everybody was awake. And when the time came for him and his wife to get up, they each had separate prayer places. So his daughter's on the third floor, his wife's on the second floor, and he's on the first floor. And the daughter stomping in the house would make sound throughout the whole house. And his wife would be annoyed because she's trying to pray. So she wants to get her husband to stop her daughter from making noise. And so he preemptively would yell, stop pacing. You can see how much peace there was, right? You ever feel that way? You're upset because your wife's upset or your wife's upset, so you're upset and vice versa and your husband wants you to get something done and your kid's doing things that they shouldn't do. And this went on for years. They prayed about their daughter all the time, but they never prayed about this. And as he tells the story, he says, you know, I never prayed about that because I knew what needed to happen. Stop pacing. That's the problem. Just stop. Stop. Have you ever been there? You don't need to pray about this problem. Just stop. Whether it's yourself or somebody else in your life, you know exactly what needs to be done. We don't need to talk to God about that. Just put the dishes away. Right? Make your bed. 
Sometimes I've given instruction to my students or to my children, and their response is, I know. And you're like, that? no, you don't. If you did, and if you do, you're not doing it. What's wrong with you? Here's the problem. When you know, you can't learn. It's the wrong posture. And before we can get help, we have to become helpless. We don't like that. Sometimes we have to be helpless before we are hopeful. Uh, Years ago, we had a minivan, and the dashboard lights needed to be replaced because you would drive it at night, and it's like, I can't tell how fast I'm going or if there's any gas in the car or anything. Like, most of the lights had gone out. And so I tried to figure out how that works. And if you know modern vehicles, that's not easy. It's not like they make the screws visible. So I needed help. And I turned to what every modern person turns to, and that is YouTube to the rescue. And I typed in Honda Odyssey dashboard lights. And there's a whole bunch of videos. And I found one that was like less than five minutes long. I watched it, boom, I got my help. I fixed it all, no damage. And we're good. And without help, I probably would have destroyed parts of that car. Help was just a few taps away on my phone. You know, many came to Jesus because they were missing something. They didn't have something they needed. And all through the Gospel of John, we see Jesus provide what is missing And if you've read the gospel, you know exactly what this list looks like. His mother comes to him in chapter 2 and says, hey, uh, the wedding, they have no wine. And Jesus says, okay. But yet he still did what she asked and he provided. And then a little bit later, there's a woman at the well and she has no water. And then there's a crippled man at the pool of Bethesda and he has no help. The crowd had no bread, and Jesus fed them. The blind man has no sight, and Jesus gave him sight. And Lazarus had no life. And Jesus called him forth from the tomb and said, come out. And out he walked. Jesus can fill whatever it is that you are missing if you would just go to him. Our weakness is the way to God's grace. When you are helpless, now you can go find some help. Where are you weak? Where do you need to admit you're helpless? When you come to God with a need, he can fill it. And prayer is the path to that need. But you must ask. Miller tells us that after many years, over 10 of his daughter's pacing, he realized something. He had never asked God to help with this situation. So he went upstairs the next morning when she began her process and he prayed with her. And that morning she laid back down and she went back to sleep. And it wasn't very many more months later that they actually sold that house that their kids had grown up in and they moved to a different neighborhood. And he said, we realized only after we moved that the trucks that were always moving in the early morning were heard by our daughter in a way we didn't understand. And it bothered her so much that it woke her up and it agitated her. And now in her new home, with their new home, she has peace. Why? Because God answered their prayer. I have been guilty of this in so many areas in my life, especially with my children and my wife. I get frustrated about something and what I think needs to happen is clear and simple. Just go do it. Do I pray about it? No. I yell. And as you can imagine, that didn't work very well. If you're a parent today, I would encourage you, teach your children the truth. Live out a life of a godly example. Bring them to church. Do all in your power to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. But above all, pray for them. Pastor Dave Early said it best, and I love this quote about prayer. God can do more in seconds than we can accomplish in years. Think about that. God can do more in seconds than we can accomplish in years. He can do it better, bigger, and more lastingly than we can even imagine. And I have seen that happen in my life. 
you know, if we can't master something, we avoid it. You don't know how to bowl? I'm not going bowling. I'm not going to start now. I can't bake. I'm not baking anything. I'm not going to learn. You know, I don't play basketball because the last time I played basketball as a sixth grader, I fractured a finger and I said, I'm done. And so now the students, Pastor Tom, you want to play basketball? Nah, I'm good. And part of the truth is, this is me. I'm horrible at basketball. So I haven't mastered it. I can't look good out on the court, so I don't play. I stay away. For many of us, if we can't be good at something or the best, we don't even bother. That's called pride. And that's what we do with prayer. I, I, don't, I don't know how that works. I, I don't understand that. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And we miss out on all that God has for us. When a big problem presents itself, you may realize that you need to pray. What will happen? Will you pray? Will you ask God to help? In the middle of the early part of COVID, so almost three years ago now, we moved. And not long after we moved into our new home, my wife started putting up uh, pictures in our hallway upstairs around this piece of art that says, Answered Prayers. My wife is a rock star about this sort of thing, I'm just going to say. And there are a bunch of pictures, and I'm going to tell you about just a couple of them. One of them is a picture of our old house that sold at the right time for the right price. Another one is one of me and my nephew who was born almost 21 years ago, and he was so small that literally, and I held him this way, you could fit him on your hand. He was that premature. He was a twin, and his brother didn't make it, but he did. And the picture on the wall at my house is of me sitting with him at lunch, and he's 18 and six foot and bigger than me by far. God is good to us. Another one is this piece of paper that's a prayer list, and on it is the name Ned Heiner, who was Laura's grandfather. And her mom prayed for him for decades to get saved. And one day, when he turned 89 years old, he accepted Christ as his savior and he became a believer. And so she put that to celebrate it. Another one is a small wooden dowel. If you remember five years ago, we had Easter. We had a big sign over here. And that wooden dowel represents my son-in-law, Miles, many of whom here prayed for you. You prayed for him because five years ago, he was not a believer. And that wooden dowel represents that he came to Christ and he's now a believer in Jesus. Thank you all for praying for him. There are many more, all reminders of the goodness and faithfulness of God. You know, one of my favorite psalms was sung by the children of Israel as they would go up to Jerusalem. It's called the Song of the Ascent. This is one of a number of those psalms. And it says this, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Sometimes in order to know that God is at work, we must look up to him and look back to what he has done. And if there is little history there for you, borrow from the people around you. For many of the pictures on the wall at my house, there was long waiting. Days, months, weeks, years, sometimes decades. And there are also pictures that are yet to be put on the wall because those prayers have not been answered yet. We are still waiting. So what do you do when there is no answer? What happens if there is no answer to your prayer? And that is why sometimes we're afraid to pray or we're discouraged in prayer. Sometimes there's no answer because we ask with the wrong motive and it shows and God knows you despair because you've been praying and your focus is on how that other person hasn't changed or the situation isn't any different so you give up 
Or you're demanding, you insist that God do what you want. Prayer has become a weapon in your battle to get what you want. Maybe your motives are right and you really are asking God to work and it seems like he hasn't. What do you do? Well, you find yourself in a desert. We live in a broken world and when, it, when, when reality doesn't line up with hope, so your reality is here and your hope is here, you feel very much the brokenness in the world and we feel like we're in a desert. If you have lots of hope, but no reality, that's denial because you're not seeing what is. And that is bound to bring disappointment and will often lead to a different problem, which is determination. I will make reality match my hope. But you don't have that kind of power. And that leads to more suffering. And then eventually it leads to despair. No hope, just reality. No more tension between hope and reality and reality and hope because hope is lost. So you find yourself in a desert and life in the desert is hard. Joseph's desert was in Egypt where he was betrayed and then enslaved and then imprisoned. Moses lived in a literal desert for 40 years. Hagar found herself in a desert after being used and abused by Abraham and Sarah. Many others in scripture faced time in the desert. Jacob, Elijah, David, and Jesus spent 40 days in a desert, fasting and praying to show his power. When he faced temptation from Satan, he overcame. But he still had to face death on a cross before resurrection would become a reality. Being in a desert brings helplessness. Your idols die. You begin to realize that without God, you cannot live. You stop being cynical. Pride dies. You learn that lust fails to satisfy. And you discover that what people think about you no longer matters. What matters most is God. Jesus knew that, and we need to learn what Psalm 63 says. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. In the desert, you understand that what truly matters is God. You'll spend time with him. Nothing else matters but talking with him. You will begin and end your day in prayer. You'll wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and instead of worrying, you'll turn that worry into prayer. When something goes wrong, your first thought will be to pray and ask God to help you. And you will begin to live out Psalm 23, verse four. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God with us. We are reminded every Christmas of this because God with us is Jesus, Emmanuel. Jesus is with us. Jesus is with you. God sent his son to become a man so he could identify with us in every way. He knows our pain. He knows our need. And because of Jesus, we can pray with boldness. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. A woman came to Jesus in the middle of his ministry and my kids actually have asked me about this. Why would Jesus call a woman a dog? She comes to him and says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, but she persisted. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And the Lord comes, the woman comes and kneels before him. Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. 
and her daughter was healed at that moment. This verse shows us why. Because we have boldness to approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Confide. When you confide in something, your secrets. It's full trust, belief in the powers and trustworthiness or reliability of a person or thing. The word is actually a Latin word that means confide. It's with faith. Monica was the mother of Augustine and she prayed for years that he would come to Christ. And if you don't know who Augustine is, he's one of the most famous church fathers. There are books about him that are still selling today and books by him still selling today like Confessions in the City of God. She grew desperate enough because her son at 15 left home, took up with a woman, they had a child, and he went off into all kinds of heresy and errors of ways in his beliefs. She went to a bishop who had been in those errors and had come to Christ and had found truth. And she asked him, will you go and talk to my son? And he refused. And Augustine later tells the story, he says, He replied that I was as yet unteachable. I was puffed up with the novelty of my heresy. Leave him alone, he advised. Simply pray for him to the Lord. He will find out for himself through his reading how wrong these beliefs are and how profoundly irreverent. When she persisted, he said, go away now, but hold on to this. It is inconceivable that he should perish, a son of tears like yours. Augustine did come to Christ, and he became a leader in the church. He actually became the bishop of that region, the Bishop of Hippo, and his works have impacted the church for centuries. Don't give up. Pray with confidence. Be bold in asking for what you need. In just a minute, we're gonna have a time of prayer and I'll invite you to come and pray. And today, maybe you hear this message and you need Jesus. You need to come humbly today and give him your life and ask him to save you. You need to pray the words of Romans 6, 23, which says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You need to ask Jesus to rescue you. And maybe you know Christ and you need to learn the practice of praying, worry, and then pray. Learn to be helpless so you can be hopeful. Look up to God and look back to what he has done. And when there is no answer, wait on the Lord. When I say worry and then pray, this is what I mean. Write out a list. Your list may be paying the bills, dealing with debt, your boss, the bully in your life. How will you parent your kids well? Your health, your parents, overloaded with school, Your tires are so bald, they're past safe. Where your next meal will come from. Wondering if anyone really cares about you. Come today with one of those things that is weighing you down. Borrow some hope from those that we have here who will willingly pray for you and believe that God is at work. Be encouraged and pray. Remember that God can do more in seconds than we can accomplish in years. Will you ask him to help you today? I'm gonna ask you to pray and then we'll have a song. Father, I pray over this group. I know that there are struggles, there are hurts, there are difficulties, there are problems that they do not know how to address. And if they're anything like me, I know that some of them, they've never asked for help because they had the answer. And today I pray that you would reveal in their hearts that they need to humble themselves so that you can lift them up. And if there's any who are prideful, I pray that you will humble them so that they will seek your face. I pray that you will work in all the ways that only you can because you can change things in seconds. You have that kind of power. I pray this all in Jesus' name.